Chris Lurie, we call the meeting to order. We do have a quorum present. Uh, item one. Uh, so, Mayor Council, tonight we have three items on your workshop session. So, obviously, I think that's more than we can get through in 30 minutes, but I planned it so that if we don't have any dead time, we've had some dead time at some prior meetings, so you'll likely uh, go into your regular and have to come back to workshop. But I'd like to get through as much of it as we can uh, during that first uh, 15 to 20 minutes. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt, and he's going to talk about salary survey. Salary survey uh, is the basis uh, for the budget. And so um, what he's going to be presenting tonight is what I'm going to attempt to get into the base budget uh, for the proposed 18-19 budget. So we'll go over it with you tonight. And if you have questions, you can talk, call me. And obviously, we'll have our one-on-one -on -one meetings on budget. We can talk about that in more detail. Mayor Council, thank you for letting me speak to you this evening. So we'll talk about compensation tonight. Uh, we'll include our salary survey results that we just got back, um, as well as what we're proposing for the upcoming plan year as far as uh, changes to our pay plan goes. Um, first thing to talk about, though, is our internal and external equities. Um, when we have a new position that we're looking at, we don't want to just say, we'll look at a job and say, this should probably pay $45,000, $50,000. There is a method to it. Um, we use a point factor analysis. And so what this does is we basically look at the knowledge, skills, and abilities required for the job, and it helps us determine where that job needs to fall on the pay plan. Um, the extra equity is very important, too, when we do our market analysis, especially for existing positions, because uh, we want to make sure what we're paying our employees is competitive, because we are competing against all the other cities in the Metroplex with that same pool of employees. Um, and so part of the Directive 2.7.4 says uh, that HR department will conduct a salary survey once a year, we reach out to our, we're part of a Metroplex survey group. And so that's made up of 14 different cities in the Metroplex. And then our neighbors, Capel, Grapevine, and Flower Mound, we reach out to them as well as one of our survey cities um, to get information on what they're currently paying. So the Metroplex group is nice. It's a centralized database where we keep all of our information they do too, of our jobs, the salaries, all that information that helps us complete this uh, survey. This is a list, I won't read through them all. But of all the different survey cities, um, again, Capel, Grapevine, Flower Mound, the survey city, just not part of that Metroplex group. So when we look at the general government positions, we want to look at each of the pay plans. So you've got your professional, your administrative, clerical, technical, your trades positions. We also look at the broadband, so that's your managers and your director level. And then we also do a survey for the appointed positions. That's a separate survey. We're actually in the middle of it right now, getting responses from all the cities. And so next month, we'll have the response back for the appointed positions. What we use, we call their benchmark positions um, that we look at. Uh, for example, on the professional pay plan, you've got a purchasing agent, librarians, planners. What they do here at the city of Louisville is essentially the same thing they do in any other city. That city may be larger, may have more citizens, it may have more employees, but the job itself is the same. And so it's a good apples to apples comparison. What we do is we take a benchmark position here, we look at the midpoint in that salary range, and we compare it to the midpoint of all those other cities' benchmark position. Uh, so we'll compare, see where we're at on that point. And then we'll take all the benchmark positions in that pay plan, we'll look at the average and compare ours, and that helps us decide if our pay plan needs to be adjusted that next year. If there is an adjustment, adjustment that we're proposing, it would go into effect October 1st. But remember, if there is a market adjustment, that's the salary range that moves, not all the employees. And so the only employees that are affected, so say the professional pay plan moves 2%. That, the, the salary changes, but only the people that fall below the new minimum will have a, a salary adjustment come October 1st. So it's really a small impact to the budget on the market. Another analysis we'll do, sometimes we'll have to look at just an individual position um, for example, we looked at the maintenance worker recently. When we see a position that has a high turnover rate, like the maintenance worker, since 2016 in October, we've had a 50% turnover. It's really difficult to recruit for that job and to retain the employees. Um, you know, we've got the maintenance workers in several departments, parks, facilities, streets, ULM. So we want to make sure that if we're falling behind on salaries, and we're seeing that turnover, that we put a focus on this and make an adjustment if we need to. 
So our results for the salary survey, you can see the different pay plans. Uh, the professional pay plan and the trades uh, were both 2% under what the market was. Uh, and then admin, clerical, um, and the technical pay plan was just 1% under the survey cities. And so that's what we'd be proposing to bring up those percentages uh, to become, uh, stay competitive. So market adjustment, that's one way to get a salary increase. Again, it doesn't affect a lot of employees. Uh, what it does, though, for general government is your merit increase. So last year, council approved a 3% increase, um, and that's what we're asking for again this year's 3%. Uh, the employees, it's on an annual basis based on your hire date or your last promotion. So you have your evaluation. If you met your standards in your work plan, you have your 3%. For police and fire, it's similar. We still reach out to the survey cities, uh, but with police and fire, we actually look rank to rank uh, in both of those areas, and we look at the maximum salaries, the, the top step. The reason we do that is because for the city of Louisville, we have seven steps for police and fire. Other cities may have less, they may have more, so you have to look at the top of range. Um, if you remember, too, back in 2016, that was the first year that we started, so we normally bring people up to market, but then we did the additional 2%. We've done that the last couple of years, and that helps us stay competitive, because as soon as we move our, our pay, everybody else moves there, so we lag behind. So this year, with the um, police officers, the variance was a 1.7% lag behind um, the rest of the, the market. So what we're proposing is bring them up to market, plus the additional 2% again this year. The average increase for the other police ranks was 1.9%. Fire, close to the same thing. We're down about 1.6% compared to the rest of the market. So if we bring them up to market plus 2%, we'd be looking at a 3.6% increase. Um, all the other fire ranks, the average was a 2.5% increase is what we're recommending. Then also back in 2016, if you remember, we had a lot of openings with the, the police officer position. We're having a hard time filling those. And so what we put into place was this lateral transfer program. And so somebody who, before this, if you work for another department, you could have been an officer for 15 years there. If you want to come to Louisville, you would have started down at step one. And so that's um, my deter some people from wanting to come make that switch to Louisville. By putting this in place, you can basically get compensated for that time that you spent somewhere else. Because if you work somewhere that had at least uh, a population of 50,000, you're an officer there, or an entity that had at least 100 police officers, like a, a, a DART, um, then you can come over here, you take that experience, and you can start somewhere in that range. And some of our officers even started at the step seven. Today, eight police, police officers have come through that program. So it's certainly helped us. And you can see on the hiring statistics for the police officers, in 15, 16, 16, 17, we had a lot of new hires, but that's because that program was working uh, and we we're bringing on new people. As of today, we do have six vacancies, um, but we continue this program as well. I believe we had 16 vacancies when we put it in place. Is that right, Chief? That's correct. Of the, for the fire department, the statistics, um, you can see we had quite a few new hires in 15, 16. Their turnover has been really good. Right now we have four vacancies, a lot of that's due to retirements. But with the new fire station opening in 2018, we're gonna need an additional 18. That is a lot of firefighters to hire. Um, we've just, I've already, already started testing. 175 people applied, 62 people actually tested. Of those, 29 of them actually passed the physical, the essay, and the rapid panel interview. So we're seeing that we've only got 29 people right now in the hopper, so we got a lot of people to hire. And so what we're proposing and we're looking at is possibly doing that same lateral transfer program for the fire department, because it works so well for the police. Uh, we would see the same uh, for the fire department. This so is just an idea. We don't have all the details. If this is something we move forward with, we definitely put together a committee within the fire department to hear from them on how do we want to implement this and how would it look compared to the, the police department. But this would definitely help us with hiring um, that many firefighters. I like this slide, it's just easy to see. It's got all of our survey cities and what a police officer with the maximum pay is. The blue is what we currently pay. The green is what the average is for all the cities. And then the pink is what we're proposing. So that's your market plus your 2%. If we were to do market plus 3%, you can see it moves us up several positions. 
And so that's one thing we'll be looking at as well this year. So council, the way I would look at that is I would try to get the market plus 2% in the base budget. Uh, and probably that market plus 3% I would put on your ad back list for further consideration by the council. I'm not promising that at this point because we are just starting the budget review process. Uh, but that's my thought process now. And, and what really worries me as I look at police, when I look at that list, Denton and Carrollton, our closest neighbors, are at the top. And so, you know, remember when, when Matt's looking at this, everybody else, their salaries are going to move too. <laughs> and so even with market plus 3%, I can't really promise you where that's going to put us. But certainly it's going to make us more competitive with those neighboring cities, but, but that would, I think, be a council decision on your ad back. Do we have any idea what their um, turnover retention? Throughout their cities? For, for like a Denton or a Carrollton? I, I don't have, I can get that for you. You can probably get that. I'm just curious. Make it part of this uh, report for you if you'd like yeah. to have that. But the one thing we did get information on recently, all of the other cities, since we started adding, uh, they just, a survey just went around recently, other cities are doing market plus three, market plus five, matching at the 65th percentile. All the other cities have implemented lateral. It's a good thing we got it in early. So, you know, that's what we all do is learn from each other. Right. So I think that's why you see like that, the blue. When we showed you this last year, we were much higher. Everyone else moved. So it still put us down in the bottom piece instead of even at that midpoint with the, the change. So we're, we're looking at that too to help us make the best decision. Sure, sure. For the fire department, very similar. Um, current salary is in the blue, and then the average is in the green. And the proposed with the market plus 2% is in the pink. But again, it's like they said, this is where it's at to propose, but if we were to look at these numbers after everybody changes, we're gonna probably come right down this area. And then if we did the market plus the 3%, that does move us up an additional spot um, for the firefighter. So one thing to mention on the police and fire, because they are they have steps, they don't have merit increases. And so when they start here, they start at step one. And then each year on their anniversary, they take a step test in HR, and then they pass that and they met their standards as a police or firefighter, they move to the next step. That increase is around 4%, but once you hit 7%, you're, that, you're topped out. Or if you hit step 7, you're, you're done, you're topped out, unless you were to get a, a market increase. But one thing to mention, your firefighters, 39% of them and 30% of police officers are eligible to move up to another step. So the majority of your police and fire here, they're already topped out. The upper ranks here with police and fire, they have just two steps, and then you move to that second step after your second year. So the broadband positions, again, that's your managers and directors. If we're looking at a new position, if we have an opening, we do look outside at other cities to see what they're paying. Um, but a lot of times, say an HR manager, for example, they what they do here, the responsibilities could be totally different. They could go over different things as the HR manager in Grapevine. Um, and so we want to look internally. So we have an open manager position. We look to see what are other managers in the city of Louisville making. If somebody promotes from within, then they're gonna get either what that job was posted to that, or they'll get a 5% increase from what they're currently making, whichever is greater. And then, since they got a promotion, your anniversary date changes, and so a year from then, you'd be eligible for a merit increase. So in summary, on that base budget again, what we're looking at for the pay plan increases is 2% for the professional and the trades, a 1% for your admin, clerical, and technical, and then a 3% for the merit. And then for police and fire, we'll do, we're asking for a 3.7% market increase for police, 36 for the firefighters. And then again, on the unfunded list, that additional 1%. So that's what I had in that for compensation. Is there any questions? Any questions? Move on. All right. Thank, Thank you. you man. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Uh, tonight I'll be presenting on a certificate of occupancies.
requirements um, that go along with that. So as I start, what is a certificate of occupancy? Ultimately, in layman's terms, a certificate of occupancy is simply a document that identifies that a building or structure is suitable for occupancy. Uh, why is a CO required? Uh, when new buildings are built, it's, uh, it identifies that that building is built to today's most current standards. If we have renovations that occur, again, it's identifying uh, any changes that have been made are meeting those minimum requirements. It's a document that allows first preventers to know if any hazards exist in the building, how many people should be in there at a, at a time, and <coughs> allows them to know, you know certain aspects of the building construction it's, itself before they actually have to go into the building. And in a lot of cases, utility companies require a certificate of occupancy before they will establish any type of utilities so they know that what they're fixing to make live with electricity or gas is safe to do so. Uh, best practices overall in the region, uh, certificate of occupancy is our almost required for anything, whether it's a new building, a tenant name change, a new tenant moves in, uh, a use changes from one to the next, and especially uh, the last bullet point I have down here, when a tenant name or ownership changes, it requires a certificate of occupancy. The language in our current ordinance, I want to point out, is located in our zoning ordinance. Uh, that presents some challenges. Anytime we have any building related, we have to go in front of PNZ before any changes can be made. Uh, our particular ordinance also has some language in here in, regarding, in regards to use of land and land use. The building, code, the building code does not identify a certificate of occupancy to be utilized for land. It's meant for identifying that a structure is safe to occupy. The land use and the use of land and things of that nature are all taken care of through the zoning ordinance. Uh, new tenant registrations, currently uh, those new tenants we're capturing through a process called new tenant registration. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, the building code does not mention new building registrations. We don't have an ordinance that requires new business registrations. And uh, more importantly, uh, as I, as I already said, it requires a certificate of occupancy, and this our language only re also requires it when no building is present. And I want to also point out, for example, a new tenant moves out. I'm going to use a hypothetical. We have a Burger King. The Burger King moves out, McDonald's decides they're not going to make any changes, they move in. Well, they go through our new tenant change, our new tenant policy. <coughs> we don't capture the new tenant information in regards to the building, the changes, who the actual occupants are, which are, is McDonald's. We don't have that information. Although we're capturing some of the information through the new tenant registration, we're not maintaining the information on the building itself. And that's part of the challenges of the way our current ordinance is uh, written. Uh, First and foremost, the zoning ordinance. It's inside the zoning ordinance. It should be maintained and governed by the building code. Uh, and we're inconsistent with the region. The one thing I will say that any city that we go to in our region requires a certificate of occupancy for tenant change, name change, ownership changes. Uh, some of the recommend, recommendations we bring to you tonight is we'd like to first move it out of the zoning ordinance. Uh, upon doing so, we'd like to remove some of the following language, especially the language in regards to land use and use of land and things that uh, are actually done on properties that are taken care of through the zoning ordinance. And we would definitely like to add that when any tenant change or ownership change takes place, that certificate of occupancy requirement comes into play. And in doing so, we'd also like to propose the uh, following fee, which is in line with the uh, survey cities. Of our survey cities, the 
majority of them charge a fee of $100. There are a few cities throughout that have an asterisk next to them. Those start at the amounts. Dallas, for instance, and I triple check that amount, they start at 280 and move up from there. I do not propose that. I like to stay along, along the lines of the majority of cities and stick with the $100 fee. Next steps, uh, first and foremost, asking for your guidance, but in, uh, as we move through these steps, uh, we first and foremost have to go to planning and zoning with any changes we decide to make upon completion of uh, going through planning and zoning. <coughs> Uh, we would then bring all those recommendations that we have in the new ordinance language after we were reviewed it with legal, bring it to the uh, another council meeting at a later date. Uh, we'll formalize the process, having those things ready, so in the event that you decide to adopt the uh, new language, it will just move forward from then, from then on. Uh, we'll coordinate with our first responders, fire department, and make sure that our process works seamlessly with everybody that's going to be involved and uh, finish there. Council question? Any questions? Makes sense. Do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you all very much. So, Mayor, you may want to go to the agenda now. And okay. Let's do that a little bit quick. We can. We'll start with the invocation by uh, Council Gilmore. Called out a pledge to the American Texas flag, uh, Councilman Ferguson. Proclamation and presentation by uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Daniels. Then we're down to out of one public hearing. Anybody have anything on that? Out of two public hearing. Public hearing. This is the juvenile curfew ordinance, and this is the second <coughs> hearing uh, required for uh, this ordinance. And I'd like to <coughs> Chief Kerbo to just talk a little bit. Brent asked a question at our last meeting. Chief and I had a subsequent conversation. I'd like him just to just share some additional information. Yeah, certainly. Uh, you know, first and foremost, just a good tool for us to be able to use, but not just for us, but also for parents. I've spoken to a number of parents who. They use the curfew to reinforce their house rules at home, make sure their kids you know, were at a, in at a reasonable time. So that's a real good benefit there. And my concern about us not continuing with this is we'd be like an island. We'd be the only one in the area that doesn't have a juvenile curfew ordinance. So does that attract other juveniles from other surrounding communities who want to come here and hang out after hours? And Chief, we, we talked about the variation in the number every year. Yeah. I think that's kind of what your question got to. Well, it's one of those things. We don't always have to run a citation to get, get compliance. You know, many times we can take the juvenile home, talk to the parents. That satisfies us from the standpoint of having uh, making contact with them. I noticed that in that last year, that last school calendar year, one of our gang officers wrote like five tickets. So I, you, you obviously use it as a tool to get the attention of gang members. So did that help? Mm -hmm. Uh, consent agenda, item four, item five. So, council, uh, this is really a request that came from employees as we went through our values implementation, and uh, it's one that we've actually struggled with dealing with in the past, and so I think it's a good clarification. It allows, if in a situation where uh, we deem it too dangerous for employees to get to work or we need to close operations earlier. It gives them a different form of leave to be able to utilize. There's been some concern that, uh, that they would only be able to use vacation um, or uh, comp time. So this would actually allow a conversion of sick leave. And really all employees have approved some sick leave. And so we think that uh, is more fair and equitable to the Item six. Item seven. Regular hearing. Item eight. So on this item, uh, Stacy will talk with you about the park development fee uh, in the workshop when we come back. 
However, I'm going to pull this item off and delay it to the next meeting. Um, number one, because a couple of the changes that needed to be made didn't get submitted uh, in the version that's in your backup. So we're going to bring that back at the next meeting. Can I go back to seven there? Yep. Um, that, you're coming southbound on McGee. You're coming down a hill and around a corner when you hit that church. Uh, so to my mind, that's, you know, your sight lines are really not that great coming south. You know, I think a lot of it has to do with the hours of operation of the church. And if you look at the study, that's what they really focused on because church did, know, operates did, Sunday morning and Wednesday night. Did they consider that the church is about to put in an entire new school? Uh, yes, that, that's really why they were looking at it. Because it won't be just Sundays now. <coughs> building a school. So, David, that's a good question. I believe they did. I mean, that was the purpose of the study. Um, now, I don't, I'm not certain that they took into account site distance issues and things of that nature. I think they were looking at traffic numbers and, uh, you know, how many people would be coming in and out of the driveway at peak times versus the peak, you know, during, I mean, during the peak times and versus the traffic on the streets. And, and I'm sorry for bringing this up now. I should have asked on Thursday or Friday, but as, as I'm chewing through this, is there any reason we could delay, uh, David, delay this item and then uh, go back and talk to the engineering firm that conducted the study and bring that back? I just, I'm getting, getting ate up when mm -hmm. schools, and especially private schools, have, you know, access mm -hmm. issues and we're, we're going to have another issue here if that wasn't addressed in the survey. Yeah, it's a good question. Now, they've got a huge parking lot and hopefully they can work to route and use it effectively, but... Well, and that may be part of it. Um, I mean, if, it, if they know what their site circulation is going to be, uh, then some driveways may be used more than others in the school. Yeah. Good question. Let, let us, if, if council wants, uh, I would ask you to pull this item and we'll bring it back to you at the next meeting after we have further discussion. Yes, yeah, because I don't think we've seen it. Or table. table. Okay. okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Out of nine. I have received everybody's recommendation, so I'd be happy to read that off and then whoever wants to make a motion. Sure. Thank you. Do I have any opposition to that? None? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, out of ten. This year's teacher? Yeah. Okay. So the um, uh, the homelessness leadership team reached out, and um, since we have, I think, the chief fallen off, um, they had asked for an additional um, representative from the city of Louisville. Um, they'd actually uh, uh, asked for Pritt and or a council member. So um, I reached out to Pritt to see what her thought was on, on staff simply because of what she's doing. I think it'd be a phenomenal integration um, because she, she just, she's got the resources and, and understands that part of our community best. Um, so that's why. Do you handle that one then? I can. Okay. As long as council's okay with it. Anybody have any opposition to that? Okay. Okay, anything else? We do have a closed session tonight. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, let's uh, reconvene at 7 o'clock in the council chamber. The tonight's meeting of the Louisville City Council to order. First item of business is the invocation given by Councilman Gilmore, followed by the pledge to the American and Texas flags by Councilman Ferguson. Please join me in a moment of silence.
I pledge to you, Texas, one state and God, one and indivisible. Thank you. Next, we'll have the uh, proclamation and presentation uh, by Mayor Pro Tem Daniels. I believe we have some gentlemen here in the audience, so come on up. Okay, I'm going to read, we have a proclamation from the city first, and then I'm going to turn it over to these gentlemen. Whereas the people of the city of Louisville, Texas, have great admiration and the utmost gratitude for all the men and women who have selflessly served their country and this community in the armed forces. And whereas the Purple Heart is the oldest military decoration in present use and was initially created as a badge of military merit by George Washington in 1782. And whereas the Purple Heart was the first American service award or decoration made available to the common soldier and is specifically awarded to members of the United States Armed Forces who have been wounded or paid the ultimate sacrifice in combat with a declared enemy of the United States of America. And whereas the contributions and sacrifices of the men and women from the city of Louisville, Texas, who served in the Armed Forces have been vital in maintaining the freedoms and the way of life enjoyed by our citizens. And whereas many men and women in uniform have given their lives while serving in the armed forces, and whereas June 18th, 2018, has officially been designated as the day in the city of Louisville to remember and recognize veterans who are recipients of the Purple Heart Medal. Now therefore, Rudy Durham, mayor of the city of Louisville, on behalf of the Louisville City Council, do hereby proclaim City of Louisville, Texas, a Purple Heart City. Thank you very much. Okay. Good evening. My name is John Lundquist, and I am the Department of Texas State Commander for the Military of the Purple Heart. I would like to thank Mayor Rudy Durham, City Council members, citizens of Louisville, and all veterans who have served our country. What does it mean when a city is recognized as a Purple Heart City? When the city of Louisville, Texas is recognized, we are remembering and honoring all Purple Heart recipients, living or dead. We are honoring all veterans living in Louisville, Texas that have served in the military. We're taking a moment to honor George Washington and his contribution to our country. We're using this moment to educate all citizens of Louisville of the sacrifice of your veterans and remind them to thank them for their service. Last thing I'll leave you with is we have a chapter uh, called Chapter 1513. It was named for a Bible verse, John 1513. I feel it's very fitting for those who have served and been in combat and returned. The verse states, A greater love hath no man than that a man lay down his life for his friends. Again, we thank you for this. I wonder if we could get some pictures, I guess. Go ahead. This is the city's proclamation from us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll get back here anyway. Come on, bring him in. One, two, three, back to the bottom. One, two, three, four. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Public hearing number one, consideration of an ordinance granting a zone change from Townhouse 2 District to Plan Development Townhouse 2 District with five variances and removal of deed restrictions. On 9.49 acres located at the southeast corner of College Parkway and Summit Avenue. The applicant plans to develop 82 townhomes and is requesting removal of the existing deed restrictions and approval of five variances. One, to allow front entry. Two, to allow a gated community and private streets maintained by the HOA. Three, to allow public utilities under private street pavement with the HOA responsible for the cost of the side street sidewalk repairs due to maintenance of the public utilities. Four, to reduce the intersection spacing from 120 feet between the Fireside Lane and College Parkway intersection and the College Parkway and Summit Avenue intersection. And five, to allow for an ornamental tubular steel fence along the east boundary of the site. PNZ recommended approval by a vote of four, of, I'm sorry, of six to zero. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the ordinance, associated variances, and removal of deed restrictions as set forth in the caption above. We have Richard Lukey, Planning Director, and Steve Linart from Linart Development, both available to address any questions. Anyone? I have, I have a couple of questions, if that's okay. Uh, Mr. Linart? If you wouldn't mind, um, just kind of giving us a little description of the, the property, what kind of price points you guys are looking at, um, and, and some of the some of the challenges as well as um, some of the opportunities you see in this particular property. Sure. This is a unique property in that it obviously had a older development on it that uh, was built, uh, constructed about three quarters of the way through. So there's existing sewer lines, water lines installed. Uh, and there's also a street that was roughly 75% complete on it. And it was designed for 33 single family detached homes. So we came in with a townhome product, which Sorry. would Sorry. change to 82 attached townhome product. Uh, we would keep the streets private. The biggest issue is that it's been sitting out there for quite a while, that there are some issues on the sewer line. So we've worked with your staff to redesign the sewer system to, in essence, abandon in place the vast majority of what's out there in the ground and run a new sewer line out uh, back of curb. Uh, and that's probably the biggest logistic. We didn't want to go in there cutting the street up into Swiss treat cheese, quite honestly, uh, to put in the new taps and to adjust it for our new lot layout. So that was the, the biggest issue on the development side. <laughs> so we've worked with staff on that, that it would be HOA-owned streets, and we would also gate both entrances. Initially, the entrance along um, college was exit only to be gated from a... Uh, a setback from the existing intersection of college and uh, uh, my, my, my has gone blank on the other street and I'm, I apologize for that but uh, summit. summit I'm sorry on summit so on that northern entrance it, there's not enough a setback so we worked with the builder on that and we decided to go ahead and gate the entire uh, project so it would be private streets with gated community on the product side townhomes be starting roughly 1,700 square feet going up into the mid 2,000 square footage wise. Price range be somewhere in the high 200s going up into the mid threes. And that'll still flex a little bit as they're designing their product. You know, we don't, we anticipate getting the first uh, development action, which will be regrading the site started in the early fall. And we're hoping to have it uh, on the ground and ready to go by first quarter of next year where they can start selling homes, constructing homes at that point. I need to get your name and address for the record. Sure. Steve Leonard, Leonard Development, 520 Central Parkway East, Suite 104, Plano, 75074. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, just, a, just a quick comment, Mayor. I did have a couple of neighbors reach out to me from the Summit neighborhood um, with some concerns. Um, I had a chance to talk with staff about the variances, about the difficulty of working with this, as well as with the quality of the product that's going to be coming in. Um, it is a change in density. 
um, which of course has some of the neighbors concerned in that area, but I think that you're gonna be a good neighbor. Uh, I think uh, it sounds like the product that you're gonna be putting on the ground looks looks solid, and quite frankly, it's it's what the market is asking for. So, um, you know, even, even I look at it and go, man, I'd love to have a little bit less yard. So uh, I appreciate you coming in here, working with staff, trying to trying to figure out how to get that, that uh, history taken care of, so. Sure, you're welcome, it was good to work with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Do we have a motion to close, to close the public, public hearing? Move to close the public public hearing. Motion to close, here's a second. Second. Motion is second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, do we have a uh, motion? Any discussion? What? Move to approve. So. We have a motion and a second to <coughs> approve. Councilor? This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council amending the zoning ordinance by rezoning approximately 9.49 acres out of the Joel Summer Survey abstract number 1323 legally described as lots 1 through 14, 15X, block A, lots 1 through 17, 18X, block B, blocks, lots 1, 2, 3X, block C, lot 1X, block D, Fireside Village Edition located at the southeast corner of College Parkway and Summit Avenue from Townhouse 2 District Zoning to Plan Development Townhouse 2 District Zoning. Correcting the official zoning map, preserving all other portions of the zoning ordinance, determining that the public interest and general welfare demand the zoning change and amendment therein made, providing for repeal or severability, a penalty and an effective date, and declaring an emergency. <coughs> Is there any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. <coughs> public hearing. Sorry. Public hearing number two. Consideration of an ordinance granting a zone change request from single family residential district to general business district on 4.03 acres located at 715 North Mill Street. An existing business is looking to consolidate its retail, office, and showroom operations at this location. PNZ recommended approval by a vote of 5 to 0. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the ordinance as set forth in the caption. Rich Available for questions is Planning Director Richard Ludke. Okay. No other speakers? Okay. We have a motion to close the public hearing? Move to close the public hearing. Second. Motion and second to close the public hearing. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and second to approve. Councilor? This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council amending the zoning ordinance by rezoning an approximately 4.038 acre tract of land out of the J.W. King survey abstract number 696 located at 715 North Mill Street from single family residential district zoning to general business district zoning, correcting the official zoning map, preserving all other portions of the zoning ordinance, determining that the public interest and general welfare demand the zoning change and amendment therein made providing for repeal or severability, a penalty and an effective date, and declaring an emergency. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Item three. Consideration of, pub, number three, public hearing. Consideration of the Louisville Juvenile Curfew Ordinance and consideration of a resolution to continue the current ordinance. This is the second public hearing. The recommendation is that the City Council conduct the public hearing and approve a resolution to continue the current ordinance. Okay. Is anyone here to speak? Okay. Uh, do we have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Do you have a second? Second. Do we have a motion and a second to close the public hearing? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve? Second. We have a motion and second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Visitor Citizen Forum. At this time, any person with business before the council not scheduled on the agenda may speak to the council. No formal action can be taken on these items at this meeting. Mayor, I have no cards. Thank you. Consent agenda. All of the following items on the consent agenda are considered to be self-explanatory by the council and will be enacted with one motion. 
There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member or citizen so requests. For a citizen to request removal of an item, a speaker card must be filled out and submitted to the city secretary. Mayor, I've received no cards. Okay, thank you. Do we have a motion to approve? <coughs> Move to approve. Second. We have a motion to second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Agenda item seven. Consideration of a variance to section 6-103E on 19.9 <coughs> acres located at the northwest corner of Valley Ridge Boulevard and McGee Lane. First Baptist Church has seven driveways along the frontage of McGee Lane and Valley Ridge Boulevard, none of which have deceleration lanes. However, a traffic impact analysis submitted to the city shows that during peak traffic times, the church does not have a negative impact on the abutting roadways. The recommendation is that the city council approve the variance as set forth in the caption. Available for questions is City Engineer David Salmon Wayne, and both Wayne Cotton and Curtis Grant with First Baptist Church of Louisville. Okay. Is there any comments on this? Mayor, I'm going to ask that we table this one. I didn't, I didn't get uh, clarity with the um, review um, since there it looks to be adding a school that's going to be adding s some different traffic loads than what okay. the church would actually be. Uh, if staff would get with the, yeah, if y'all haven't already, to get with the church representatives here. and uh, City Attorney, do we need a specific date to table this to? Otherwise, we can't do it. So the next meeting? Okay, so let's table it to our next uh, July 2nd. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion? Counselor? I got off through here. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Item eight. Consideration of an ordinance amending chapter six by making provisions for a park fee and other related requirements and amending section 2-201 by amending the park development fee rate. Based on an evaluation of current level of service and the estimated population growth, staff recommends amending the ordinance to include a parkland dedication requirement a cash in lieu of land option, and increasing the park development fee to reflect the cost of improving the park system to accommodate the recreation needs of the community. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the ordinance as set forth in the caption. Okay. Uh, City Manager, do you have something on this? Yes, Mayor, I'm asking that you table this to the next meeting. Uh, there were some items that were left out of the ordinance that was in your backup, and so we need to bring that back for further uh, review. Move to table to July 2nd. Okay. Second. We have a motion to second to table until July the 2nd. Any other discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Agenda item nine, discussion and consideration of appointments to various city boards, commissions, committees. The recommendation is that the city council proceed with the appointment process to the various city boards, commissions, and committees. I'd be happy to read, um, you've all contacted me with who you'd like appointed, I'd be happy to read that for you all. Okay, go ahead. Animal Services Advisory Committee, Denise Jeffrey to place number two, Ethel Strother to place number four, and Jeannie Cool to place number six. Arts Advisory Board, Al DeBerry to place number two, Sarah Hicks to place number four, Dr. Tracy Gardner Petaway to place number six, Ken Lannon to place number eight. Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee, Eric Page to place number two, Denise Shepard to place number four, Audris Klementski to place number six. Louisville Housing Finance Corporation, Sheila Taylor Clark to place number two, Mary E. Smith to place number four. Library Board, Jennifer Lindy to place number two, Jean Ferguson to place number four, Rosario Kyler to place number six. Oil and Gas Advisory Board, Jennifer Whitaker to place number two, place number four will remain vacant, <laughs> Kathy Stock to place number six, and place number five will remain vacant. Old Town Design Review Committee, Amanda Ferguson place number two, Jack Miller to place number four. Park Board, William Schull to place number two, John Dalvig to place number four, James Collier to place number six, Casey Kirk Dunn to place number eight. Planning and Zoning Commission, William Meredith to place number one, Mary Ellen Mitzka to place number three, 
Karen Locke to place number five, James Davis to place number seven. On tours number one, Francesca Al Whaley to place number two, Kelly Strokes to place number four, and at this time, place number three will remain vacant. Tours number two, Philip Huffines to place number two, John Lynn to place number four. Zoning Board of Adjustments, Antonio Galazzi to place number two, Douglas Hicks to place number four, Audrey Kleminski to alternate number two. Louisville 2025 Advisory Board, Nika Kos Akapala to place number two, Amanda Ferguson to place number four, Kristen Green to place number six, and, place, and Karen Locke to place number eight. The places that remain vacant will continue to search for, app, for appointees for those boards. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. I want to thank all the people that have been uh, reappointed, who've been appointed for the first time, and all the other ones that are still willing to serve on these committees, and we do appreciate their time and effort in this. Thank you. Item 10. Consideration of appointment to the Denton County Homelessness Leadership Team. The City of Louisville appoints two members of the Denton County Homelessness, Homelessness Leadership Team, a council member and a city staff member or member of the community. A vacancy exists in the city staff member, mem member of the community position. Neighborhood Services Coordinator Prit Patel has expressed an interest in serving. The recommendation is that the City Council consider appointment of Prit Patel to the Denton County Homelessness Leadership Team. Move to appoint Prit Patel to the Denton County Homelessness Leadership Team. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, next item is reports. We'll start with you, Nika. Do you have anything? Okay. Mayor and Council, I have the pleasure of introducing Jason Moore. He is our new economic development manager. Jason comes to us from Richland Hills, where he was an assistant city manager uh, with a lot of departments under his purview, including parks, economic development, planning, tons of other ones. So <laughs> he brings a lot of experience to the city. Uh, before that, he was in North Richland Hills. Again, uh, primarily dealing with planning and parks. So uh, one of his areas of expertise is the, are those two areas which are very tied to economic development. Uh, we're very happy to have him here. Uh, nobody more than me <laughs> since he's been understaffed. And uh, so the next time you see a project you don't like, blame him, not me. <laughs> 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 Jason, would you like to add well, anything? I, uh, Mayor and Council, good evening. i just like to say I'm, I'm very excited about this opportunity, and I look forward to working with you all. Okay, Thank welcome you. aboard. Thank you. Thank you. Stacy, Mayor, Council Members, Park fans, I just want to invite everybody out to the Senior Activity Center this Thursday at six o'clock. We're going to start the process of master planning the future Valley uh, Vista Nature Park. So we're asking everybody to come out and give us their ideas and see how we can incorporate that into the plan. So hopefully this fall we can go for a big grant to get that started. Good. Okay. Chief? Second. We see him? No. Chief? Got to hear it. Mayor the Lakes, uh, just over a foot below the conservation pool level. Thank you. <laughs> Brent? Mayor? Nothing, Mayor. TJ? Mayor, it's uh, summertime, and I'm going to encourage everybody, if they have a web browser handy, handy to go to library.cityoflewisville.com, and don't ever let your kids get away with saying, I'm bored, i got nothing to do, because the library is completely jam-packed with activities this summer. I'd uh, specifically encourage folks to come check out The Hive. Uh, there are lots of educational opportunities to come learn how to uh, 3D print, how to use a laser cutter, how to, how to use all the new tools. I am particularly interested in the embroidery class that is coming up, so you may see me there. Um, with that, uh, I'll leave the table. Thank you. Good. City Manager. Uh, we have a, a very exciting announcement, too. In fact, we did a press release today. 
to this effect. So as everyone knows, our long-term uh, time police chief is retiring the 1st of September, and we are promoting uh, Kevin Deaver uh, to be our new police chief. Kevin, would you stand so everyone can see you and stare at you? The chief will continue to be our chief uh, through September, uh, but uh, Kevin will be taking over the realms at the, the reins at the end of uh, August. Okay, congratulations. I didn't do anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, Festa Theater presented by DFW Play Group on June 23rd. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce's uh, Women's Leading Business Conference and Expo is on June 28th this year. Uh, Sounds of Louisville on June 19th. Uh, Dave Matthews tribute band called Warehouse. And on June 26th, uh, Vegas Night with Elvis. Uh, acoustic Jam on Fridays always. Uh, I mention that frequently, art pop-ups in the plaza on Saturdays, Pilates in the plaza Thursdays and Saturdays, yoga in the plaza on Wednesdays. We have a couple of art exhibits uh, that are going to open, um, John Coke solo exhibit and uh, members of the black and white exhibit. Those both open on June 23rd in the MCL Grand Gallery. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Councilor Troyer? Uh, nothing, Mayor. Okay. Councilor? Okay. Julie? Getting another election under your belt, so okay. <laughs> Officer, thank you for your service to the community. Um, you want to read the closed session, Julie? Can you go back and take it out, please? Hmm? We need to finish the workshop. Okay. Uh, okay, first, hold on a second, Julie. We're going to go into close, uh, excuse me, we're going to go back into our workshop and finish it up. Then we will uh, go into closed session. And uh, in accordance with Texas Government Code, subchapter D. We're not there yet. <laughs> We're not going to do that? After you come go back, back into our... I can't just continue it right now. Okay. Sorry. Forget what I just said. We're going to go into uh, workshop. Sorry, no. Okay. New process. Yeah. Sorry.
And no Mr. Goodbar? No. You're not looking for Mr. Goodbar? Nasty. I bet you like raisins in your chocolate. Oh, that's right. Oh, he just likes the born. You just like that first one. Oh, okay. Right? Eat me in my chocolate. Nothing in my chocolate. Monty or something with your specialty parks. And that list, if you added it up, would cost us about $45 million to execute over five to 10 years. Um, one of the recommendations was also that we look at the park development fee and reevaluate how we, we calculate it. And working with the parks board, we came up with a suggestion to update uh, the, the, the fee, which currently is $750 per dwelling unit. So if a 100 uh, unit plan, uh, plan development comes in, uh, we charge $750 for each one of those units. The recommendation that we're making to, to, uh, for improving the, the development fee is to add a horizontal component or a dedication requirement based on our current level of service for residents. So, if we want to keep pace with what our projected population growth is for the number of acres that we provide, over the next uh, five to 15 years, we need to add three acres of parkland per hundred of dwelling units that are coming in based on what our average per um, average number of people who live in our dwelling units. Um, so if, if 100 dwelling units were proposed, we would ask them to, to give us three acres of property to use as a park. However, in some cases, taking park land isn't the best for the city nor the development. And we would offer a money in lieu of or cash in lieu of option that we would base on the market price per acre. We're proposing instead of every time there's a development, we go out and get a a um, land appraisal that we use general areas of town to come up with a value for what an acre would be to develop in that area to use for that. And that we would have a third party land appraiser to help us establish that amount um, every three years. So that would be your horizontal portion of the, fee, of the development fee. You would, our capacity to go get land or improve stuff that we have. And then we would we need to continue need to need a development fee to build vertically. So once we have this property, to add amenities to it, um, and this fee should be um, based on what the construction of park elements would be for that three acres of land, so to speak. It should be um, based on those general costs. And we're proposing that we increase that to $1,000 per dwelling unit based on what current prices are to develop park uh, um, amenities, whether it be a playground, parking lots, um, pavilions, landscaping, and the like. And one of the changes that we'd also like to um, propose is that instead of the fee being collected at the time that someone's uh, filing for a building permit, that it's at the time that a plat, the plat happens. Uh, just for uh, planning purposes on our side, we get it and we know that we're going to be able to use it immediately to, to improve parks in that area or buy it. Or when it comes in with the building units like we have right now, it takes a long time sometimes and so that kind of liability is waiting out there for us to, to get it. 
Um, sorry, I built all these neat little things. Um, can I go back? <laughs> So we would collect 225,000 in cash in lieu of um, fees there. But then we would also have our uh, development requirement of $1,000 per unit. So we would collect 150 there so we could go and, and build vertically. And so the possible payment if we didn't take land would be 375,000. We would also have some options that there might be some land that we want, but not all of it, and so we can negotiate with the developer there. Um, so that's just a, a just one that's out there. So one that uh, development that has occurred recently, where uh, I, we applied the formula, would be the Lakewood Hills development, which is out on the northeast side of town, towards the Castle Hills area. Well, you'll note and remember that on our map, we are part deficient out on that side of, of town. So they had 260 units there. We would require 7.8 acres of land out of that development to, uh, to meet our requirement. If we did not um, take the land, and we use the average of 50,000, we take 390,000. Um, and we'd also collect the 260 um, for the park development. Now, what we would use this for is perhaps uh, hitting on our need for a neighborhood or community park in that area, working with the developer for park and trail connectivity on that side of town. If you remember of our parks master plan, we have a lot of trails that still need to be built out there. Um, as opposed to right now, we've only collected the 750 per unit. So, uh, as I talked a little bit earlier, is one of the litmus tests for uh, the um, legality of a um, park development or dedication ordinance is that it helps you maintain a current <coughs> level of service. The ordinances that have been have been written and that have survived judicial scrutiny have been the ones that maintain a, a current level of service. And you can kind of see from our 17 uh, cities who, who, who have them, they have varying ratios depending on what their current level of service is and how they want to get to it. Uh, Capel, Denton, Flower Mound, Fort Worth, and uh, McKinney are all do have an ordinance that is similar to the one that we are um, proposing, however, based on what their need for property is. Uh, Flower Mound, I spoke to them um, about some of the projects that they've had uh, come up over the last uh, two to three years. Their market value for it, uh, an acre has ranged for, from $44,000 per acre to $180,000 per acre, depending on what area of town that they have um, seen the development. And I think that's why it's important to make sure that we have a, a market value that's set on general areas and not just say, blanket, here's what we're going to charge throughout the city. Um, so uh, like I said, everybody does it just a little bit differently. Capel created theirs after their original uh, parkland dedication was challenged. And they went back and redid it this way in the manner that we've asked, asking for a, a parkland dedication or a cash in lieu and a park development fee that were based on market value for cash in lieu and what it actually would cost them to build 
uh, for an acre of land. Can you go ahead and tell me what the challenge was? What what was challenged? What was challenged was the methodology. The, was the methodology. Like, how did they come up with it? Some people have done the, um, well, let's see what our neighbors do and don't have any basis for how that actually helps you maintain your current level of service. Okay. Um, does that, did that answer your question? So. Can't okay. be just a market analysis, it's kind of like an impact fee, where yeah. you have to have a, a prescribed methodology. A rationale. Yes, right. States. Yes, sir. One question, is there a review component in this ordinance where we go back and review this every few years because our service, as we build a more, a more service area, it'll have to change. Yes, sir. Every five years I'm supposed to bring a report, okay. and every year we are supposed to um, look and recalculate our um, development fee, our vertical is what Okay. Um, I just saw that potentially as a challenge going forward. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. So what I hear you saying in all of this is that these fees maintain the level of service. So if I add 100 people, it maintains the, the level we have today. But it does not fill the gap of where we would like to be, right? right. It can't be used. Or it's not being used to catch up right. if, we feel, if we feel we're already deficient. Bless you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. The legal system hasn't caught up with the idea of the 10-minute walk to a park yet. It's, we're still stuck on the um, current level of service. Gotcha. Um, but this, is, this does help us fill a lot of the gap that will occur as the population grows. I think we're thinking that by 2020 we'll add 6,200 <coughs> people and that's how we, bless you, figure out the, the ratio. Since we're doing questions, so the biggest question I had when I read through this was, I looked at Carrollton and Plano and it says they require dedication. So obviously you can do that. Um, the concern was that somebody would come in and go, sure, I'll give you a, I'll give you some acreage here. You can have my, you know, detention pond and mosquito farm and right. um, there. Uh, I got rid of that thing and uh, I'm happy. And so is there not a way to for the city to have um, the first decision making power and saying you you have to you be in your situation, you have to, you know, don't give us land, I don't need land. I need money, or give me land, I need land, I don't need your money. Yes, um, part of the, the way that we've written it is that we have the capacity, after we look at their original, their first submittal, we decide if that fits in with our plan and will work well. Um, if we say it won't work, sorry, we want cash in lieu. There is a capacity that wetlands can count for 50% of the requirement. Because there might be a time, place that we want that, that we'd sure. like to attract, you know, waterfowl, whatever, um, to, to the area, and it would enhance what we're trying to do. But yes, we have the first re review. Um, for instance, if there are two developments coming in, uh, or there's gonna be multiple phases, rather than having a whole bunch of little pocket parks, yep. I'd like it to be, you know, all in contiguous in one area so that those all those developments could enjoy it, and it limits our, um, maintenance responsibilities, you know, and how, how we do that and how it helps us create some economy of scale there. So yes, sir, it's in there. Good. Um, and this just kind of goes on as it's the intent that the cost of, of the new, the park <coughs> system to maintain that current level of service comes with the new um, residents, not necessarily burden the residents that are already paying for it. And so, um, and one of the things I wanted to make sure is when I was talking to a developer about these potential changes, they were a little worried that the cost of their, the cash in lieu of land value would be based like on what they pay for a commercial piece of property. It's not. It's going to be based on residential, um, which is what parks are, are, are stationed at. So our next um, steps would be um, when this comes back before you to adopt the ordinance. As soon as we do that, we'll create the, we'll work with the appraiser to do the market analysis for that per acre cost. Um, and then we'll have an annual review of the cut construction and development costs for the budget preparation each year. We'll bring that as part of the budget process. Take two. <laughs> Is there any concern? I mean, it seems like this puts us at the top of pricing or near the top. 
you know, right next to like Flower Mound as far as the cost. Any concern that this could hurt development? There are some concerns, but I do think just like we have in other cases with our fees, we're going to do with the, some developments uh, negotiation. Um, we'll have economic development agreements where these could be partially waived. We would have to work with that. I have some real concerns for it in Old Town. I think that would be one area we'd have to be really sensitive. Of course, we have a lot of park leads in Old Town, too, so there's a balance. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Any other questions? Okay, good. What do we do next? Uh, that's all we can, Mayor. Um, we'll bring this back to you at the next meeting. Okay. Now we go out there and close that and then come back here for the session. <laughs> Can we do the right here? Yes, sir. Okay. We're now going to go into executive session. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, we'll reconvene back into regular session. Is there any action to be taken? Mr. Mayor, I move to authorize the city manager or her designee to sign all documents necessary to sell approximately 3.668 acres of real, real property situated at the A.G. King survey, abstract number 698, in the city of Louisville, Denton County, Texas, and being all of lots 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, block 17 of Key, of Keeley Edition, in addition to the city of Louisville, Denton County, Texas, according to the plat thereof, recorded... Uh, in volume one, page five of the Platt records of Denton County, Texas, and being all that, all of that certain tract of land conveyed to Jim Emmett Stockard as de described by deed recorded in volume 489, page 684 of the deed of records of Denton County, Texas, and being all of that tract of land conveyed to J.E. Stockard as described in deed recorded in volume 720, page 969, deed records of Denton County, Texas, and being all of that certain tract of land conveyed to J.W. Stockard as described by deed recorded in volume 250, page 40 deed records of Denton County, Texas, to Trinsic Acquisition Company, LLC, for $1.517,891,000 with a 120-day inspection period. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Any other action? Move to adjourn. Second. To adjourn. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. We are adjourned. Good night. <laughs>